Page has been passing out the funny eggnog again? <laughs> we got a bunch of animals here tonight. <laughs> it's, remember what we said about as you yeah. approach Christmas? People right. start to go bananas yeah. for some reason? <laughs> and you saw all sound bananas tonight. Have you, you haven't shopped yet? Not yet, no. You know, I went shopping today. I really did. Did you? True. Economy is in bad shape. Economy is bad. What happened? Would you know, due to the, to the recession, Santa Claus this year had to drop two of his hose. Ooh. And you, you went shopping for that? <laughs> oh, I went to a bargain basement for that, for that job. No, Christmas doesn't feel, whew. <laughs> Six minutes to go of this. I hate to start out in a trench. <laughs> Christmas does not feel the same here as it does back in New York. That's true. We were in New York for about, what, nine years with the show? Yeah. You go into a department store here, there's something up that's unsettling about hearing uh, Bing Crosby recording of I'm Dreaming of a Styrofoam Christmas. <laughs> what, what happened to the animals I had a moment ago? But they do have some, but I want to tell you seriously. <laughs> as Bob would say. Yes. They have some terrific toys. I wish I had little kids this year. You know, little babies, because they have to have some great, uh, great toys. <laughs> what are some of them? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, they have a new Charo doll. How does that work? What? How does that work? Well, you wind it up to stop it. <laughs> and they have a new Dan Rather doll that investigates Betsy Wetsy's water. <laughs> that's, uh, that's out this season. Uh, Do you think maybe, it might be uh, too early for Christmas jokes? I did Christmas jokes last night and they were a smash. That's what I mean, it might be just too early. <laughs> anyway, I'll get out, I'll get out. See, if I had funny clothes like that, I'd dynamite. But it's time for our annual Christmas staff party. Now. <laughs> No, last year we had a Christmas staff party here for the Tonight Show every year, and boy, it was a great last year. All these, all the stockings were hung with great care, and the rest of the clothes were all over the room. <laughs> oh, I see. That's that's, that's what they were. It got a little out of hand last year. Now, don't don't do it this year. No. You know, you had too many of the eggnogs, and he woke up in a motel with his arm around a Scotch pine. <laughs> How you checked in with that, I'll never know. I got my NBC, the president, I got my NBC present from the executives already. Beautiful. I got my own can of Baraxo for the men's room. That's, that's, that's what I got. What did you get? <laughs> Anything uh, in the news? Yes, there is. <laughs> Let's, let's get right to it. Uh, we'll get off the Christmas theme. Uh, how about some, uh, some remarks about the state of the economy? The president, as you know, made a, made a speech about the economy the other night. And you know what he said? The president said, prices are too high, there are too many unemployed, and the country is in a recession. By George, I think he's got it. <laughs> And he said that he's concerned about the three devils. Inflation, recession, and energy. And you know he's gonna, how, to, how he's gonna handle the three devils? He's trying to get Congress to approve the Night Stalker. <laughs> I, knew, I knew that wasn't gonna go. <laughs> I don't know why up in my office when I read that, when I said that, I kinda like it and I said, you know, you have that intuitive thing in the back of your brain that says, don't do that joke, because it probably won't go. But once in a while you do one, for yourself. So far, I've done about eight for myself. <laughs> now I'm gonna do one for you. And you, you, of course, will be the judge of that. Who's in the news again? Mr. Rockefeller. He's already approved as vice president, but according to the men's fashion designers around the country, they say he's a lousy dresser. They want him to change his image. And Bill Blass, who is one of the, I guess, uh, fine men designers in the country, cannot understand how a man who has $600 million Looks so shabby. He's, he's rumpled all the time. And you'd look rumpled too if you had a suit full of IOUs. <laughs> Another one for me. 
We gotta come up with one for you folks, cause uh, <laughs> Fanny Fox is in the news again. <laughs> now this has nothing to do with Congressman Mills. She was arrested in Florida. It was in the paper today. She is performing an act, nightclub act down there, getting $15,000 a week. State of Florida arrested her for indecent exposure. They said she was completely naked during a performance. You see, in Florida, it's against the law to show your tidal basin. <laughs> in New York City, maybe if I get out of this area, maybe I'm working too local. You, know, I'll, I'll you mean in the building or what? No, no, I... <laughs> Let's go to New York. Okay. Now, New York. <laughs> New York's in financial trouble. Did you read that? We have the, the, the mayor back there is Abraham Beam. You won't even answer me. You'd see, usually when I'm going great, you will throw little asides back and forth. But when I'm going into the, the biffy, you just... You, you just, go alone. You just stand there. And walk. It's just me and the tidy bowl, man. You just stand there and look at me. What was I talking what about? What happened about New York? They're having financial trouble, and they laid off 2,000 policemen in the city of New York. Yes, that's true. And uh, the mafia immediately laid off 200 criminals until after the emergency. Uh, let's see. Uh, how about some prison news? Great segue. This is in the paper today. It's kind of sad. They just released in Indiana a gentleman who is 89 or 90 years old who now holds the record for being in prison the longest of anybody in the world. How long do you think he was in prison? This is sad. 66, 66 years. years. And they let him out today. And he went in in 1908 for murder. He was supposed to go to the chair, but they didn't use electricity, and they sent him to the steam chair. <laughs> didn't kill him, but it took the wrinkle out of his knickers. <laughs> but he got out today, and... Uh, to show you how times have changed, the warden gave him a $10 bill, asked him what he was gonna do, and he said he's gonna buy half a dozen suits. <laughs> back in Los Angeles. <laughs> back here in the West Coast, the, uh, the Los Angeles police are having some trouble. Uh, well, they're not really having trouble. Uh, I'm having trouble. But, uh, <laughs> no, what it is, um, they have been storing uh, drugs to be used in evidence in court cases coming up. You may have read this. And some of the stuff is disappearing, and they find that the mice... The mice have been eating the marijuana that they have stored there. And uh, they got wise uh, when they discovered mouse holes uh, in the ceiling. <laughs> Okay, we got, a, uh, we got a good show for you tonight. <laughs> what did you just stand there and look? No. no. Why don't you do something to help me? Why not tell us who's on the show? Well, I'm gonna, Bob Hope is here tonight. Yeah. Now, how's that? This Christmas, Bob is going to be entertaining our fighting men and women at the supermarket checkout line. <laughs> right here. Also, we have Mr. Richard Harris is yeah. with us tonight. <laughs> Very funny man. Steve Landisberg mm -hmm. is good boy tonight. And the young lady who plays uh, the daughter on the television show Maud, Adrian Barbo. Yeah. Is here. <laughs> we'll be with you. In fact, <laughs> What a wonderful time for this particular product. Yeah. <laughs> and now a message. <laughs> Brought to you by Excedrin. We have returned. Tis the season to be jolly. I thought I'd reiterate that in case you got a little bit despondent. There's no need to feel... Also, not a creature is stirring. Yes, especially here. <laughs> especially in this star. 
No, I think it's a set, it's that quiet time of year. Sometimes people are overwrought with uh, anxiety about Christmas. Other things are on their mind, what to get Cousin Grace. And they might be thinking about that when you're hitting one of your blockbusters. It wasn't evident tonight. Are you, tonight, are you I mean, trying to are you trying to bail me out? No, I was just saying that the monologue was subpar. Is that is that what you're insinuating? Well, it was not. Let's say it was not a skyrocket to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was a. We should have aborted that, like the astronauts <laughs> so, do when the when the missile doesn't. Well, you go, know it's not going to make. I've it. got to have some way to abort quickly and bail <laughs> out, and launch. so they can pick me up in the ocean out here in. somewhere in a in a dinghy. Uh, Let's see, uh, you have anything to? That's your a lot of people coming up, important people. What? Ba what? Back to me, huh? No, no, no. I, everything is fine. We're Any anecdotes happened to you the past weekend that <laughs> the folks might be interested in? Nothing at all. A lot all. of funny stories. Nothing at all has happened. Nothing happened. It's been one of the bleakest weeks I've, I can remember. <laughs> In fact, I was saying to myself... Maybe some amusing anecdotes shopping. Nothing? I, I say. No shopping. You see, I don't go the last. I had to go early this year because I'm traveling. Well, tell us about that. <laughs> that sounds pretty exciting and interesting, and I know our viewers at home. Uh, well, the folks are having as much fun at home as we are here in the studio, right? <laughs> nothing uh, extraordinary, just a little travel. Just, nothing. Just traveling, I see. Yeah, okay. okay. Getting in my car, just traveling. Okay. We Who's have coming a... up in the uh, days ahead? It might be of interest to our folks. <laughs> <laughs> Anything in the world to separate these two commercials. <laughs> we don't look as the show that we're just killing time we, to we do don't. commercials. We don't. No, we... <laughs> Did you ever watch? No, tell us. Look at that list of people. My God. My God, it's a whole list here. Yes. Those are, those are some of the people we're going to have on. <laughs> No sense in reading them, no. but I mean, as long or as they, they can see as them. long as they have a little, I wouldn't sure. type up a list no. if we didn't have names typed on them. A lot of people there. A lot of names typed there. Any star. Um, let's get a guest out here. Oh. Nice. Oh. I feel like a 90-year-old man who just got out today. <laughs> 66 years in the first six minutes. Richard Harris is an exceptional uh, new guest, Shirley. New guest list just came in. Wait, wait. New, new guest new list. New guest, what is it? New guest list? Oh, I thought that's why it's yeah. a new, new additional guest. <laughs> uh, Richard Harris yeah. is an exceptional actor. He is. And recording artist. What, what's wrong? No, I was just look, admiring your tie. I was just looking at that. It's an unusual oh, come tie. Come on, who cares? They're not just, that's, see, that's, that's called Phil talk. That's what? small chit chat. What? When you say you got a nice tie. I didn't say you had a nice you tie. Build I a said show. I was looking at you. You can't tie. build a show out of. There's a difference between saying that's a nice tie and I'm looking at it. Okay, but that. I haven't made up my mind yet. People aren't going to stay at. The, the idea, you see, the idea we're here and we do this is so people at home will be entertained. Yes. People are going to get awful wise when you say, that's a nice tie. We've gotten away with it for 12 years. <laughs> You have one long eyebrow that bothers me that's hanging down there. Well, don't pull it. No, oh, yeah, you notice. No. Come here, you've well, got one. Why? Don't pull it. Why? That, you should take that out. No, no, no. Just pull it. No, no, no. no. You have one. <laughs> well, it bothers me. You ever watch somebody and... What? <laughs> well, that's right. Last time, you got a bloody nose. That's right. I so that. don't hurt me. You can't, I'll, I'll can't, you, can't you see that? What? Hang it. Can't you see that hanging down in front of you? Okay, yes. It's got to look like a big rope that close. <laughs> You're a big long one. I have long eyes. Sure, easy for you. You got yours in the can for the whole season. <laughs> Comes in and watches us die now. <laughs> well, uh, we're going to be right what back. What became of uh, Richard Harris? What? What ever became of Richard Harris? You were speaking of. Well, he uh, what? Fred, we just did a great monologue and a commercial. <laughs> tonight? What? <laughs> tonight? No, not tonight. Oh. Well, we've done that before. Oh. Don't you think that Richard? What? Seems a long time ago. That's our own producer doing that. I don't want to do the commercial. I don't want to bring Richard Harris out, and I don't. What do you want to do? I'll go home. Let's look through this. <laughs> Let's look through this book. I'm gonna play with my arrow. You play what? with the arrow. I'll look through the book. That's Bob's new book, isn't it? Oh, look at these pictures. Aren't they nice? Hey, let's let's read let's read Bob's book. <laughs> Here we are in Korea. Funny stuff in this book, but Bob will tell it, of course, hysterically when he comes out. <laughs> Good night for Bob. That's Richard Harris' new album, there. This is Probably. a. Yes. 
is how do you pronounce this? Khalil? Khalil. Khalil Gibran. Khalil Gibran. Which is a, what the prophet Khalil he wrote, Gibran. and uh, Richard Harris has... Uh, Great stuff. Um, he started with this classic and done a uh, musical interpretation of this mm, book, and he's going to do it. Hmm? That must be great. It's it's superb. Yes. <laughs> Which is another one. Didn't I just say it was great? Yeah. It's just reiterating it, that's all. <laughs> uh, so that we can keep Mr. Harris's... Um, we don't, so we don't have to interrupt him so much when he just gets out here. Maybe right. we should do this commercial first. That'd be a good idea. Then he will come out, you see. Otherwise, he would just come out and then would have to do this and would right. hurt. It is. <laughs> you know, I have a feeling someday that I'm going to go right from this desk to the motion picture country home <laughs> in Woodland Hills. They're not, I'm not... Yeah. They're not even going to... Just right from here... And as you're leaving, Right up say, Ventura. But first, ladies and gentlemen. But first, I'll be right, right back. And we will be uh, right after this message of interest. Richard Harris will be here, and Bob Hope is here, and Adrian Barbo is here. And, uh... Welcome one of our favorite madmen, Mr. Richard Harris. Good to see you. You too. Thank you. You sound great. You're in good form, huh? <laughs> well, we're in some kind of form. We're we in some kind of show then. Yeah, we're good. We'll get rolling. We'll get rolling. <laughs> you have been rolling. It's great. Yeah. You look very uh, fair. You been outdoors in the sun or what? Makeup. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Number five. Well, oh, but you look very healthy and so forth. I feel great. Are you off? Uh, the last time you were here, you talked about no more cigarettes and you were you weren't drinking anymore or? Well, I uh, I uh, I'm off the booze. I got a telegram for my liver. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> he said, help. So you and decided I, to... Uh... No, no, I didn't, actually. I, I'm off the booze. Right. But smoking, I got acupuncture. Oh, can you believe? I promise you, I got acupuncture for smoking. So I'm was... smoking 100 cigarettes a day. That's so five thought, packs a day? Yeah. Yeah, and I went to... I, and, and they said this acupuncture works. So I went to acupuncture, because a friend of mine had it done. So I went there and they said, you want to go off? I said, yeah. So he said, take your clothes off. So I said, I came for acupuncture. <laughs> so I uh, took my clothes off and laid down on this bench. And then he got needles and he looked at my, put my legs out like that. And he felt my ankles and he stuck a needle there and the needle there and a needle there, needle there. And then he, my knees, a needle there, needle there, a needle there, needle there. And I laid it, and he put a needle there, and a needle there. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> Move on up. <laughs> Move on up. <laughs> right here. <laughs> and, and, and then, this is true, honest to God, I promise it's true. And then, they finally put little staples in my ears. I'm deaf, but I'm, I've, I've, cu I've cut down from 100 to about 20 a day now. Well, that's very much... Yeah, really. Did it they're, really... they're in there now. Mm. Yeah. Well, I've heard about this. Now, this is a, a, a fad of alcohol called staple puncher that they're using for um, people on diets. Mm. That's right, yeah. Uh, that they say is supposed to um, keep down the desire. Yeah, it does. Uh, You're supposed to... When you, well, it's attached to a nerve that goes to your stomach for anxiety, and as soon as you feel you want to smoke a cigarette, you press... But Staple your lips together. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. If that doesn't work, then you just set fire to your ear. <laughs> <laughs> how, many, how many times did you have acupuncture? Just the one time? Yeah, just the one. I've got to go back because I went a little over the 20. I went 26 the other day, so I'm going to go back again. Now, do you think it's more psychological, or do you think physiologically they did something to you that I really cut no. the desire? Uh, they did, yeah. There's no doubt that the anxiety is, is kind of diminished a little. Yeah. No, a lot. A lot. A lot. Well, that's great. Poor little Annie, the new wife, the bride. How is Annie, anyway? She's beautiful. Yeah, I know she's beautiful. Yeah, she's terrific. Yeah. Really great. She's a saint. She's marvelous. She, poor thing, I think of it. <laughs> well, because the first day or two, I, she's saying to me, you've got to stop smoking. Please, a hundred a day, stop smoking. So then, 
The couple of days I was off, I sort of walk around the house when the urge was too strong for me, and I sort of, get out of my way, move, and I screamed at her. And the next morning, I woke up, and I had a cigarette in my mouth, and she lit it. Mm. And she said, better you die five years early and put me through that again. Yeah, that's the problem. You, you, but you don't have those, uh... No. You get them now and then, but I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I run around the block. How, how long have you been married to the saint now? I remember when you first came here. <laughs> They'll canonize Annie. Yes. <laughs> I think she'd be the Pope. Oh, she can't. She's Jewish. Yeah. How about Harris for Pope? Wouldn't that be nice? You like that, yeah? Yeah, Harris for Pope. Yeah. Could you imagine? Instant sin, instant sex. Mm -hmm. Total absolution. In a bed, roll out of bed, forgive it. <laughs> I have a feeling that's probably not going to catch on in a big way. <laughs> Privately, you may have a lot of, lot of people uh, that agree with you. Yeah. Do you like this time of year? Do you like the holidays? I like Christmas. Yeah. I really love... I'm sentimental about Christmas. I really love Christmas. Do you go out uh, yourself and, and, and shop? Uh... Oh, yeah. I got a lot of friends, a lot of, a lot of relatives, a lot of brothers, three sons. I'm glad... I'm glad that my sons discovered... There's no Santa Claus. I'm glad they didn't discover it the way I discovered it. I discovered it in probably the most extraordinary way that you could discover there was no Santa Claus, because I believed it for so long. And it was my dad, who was very tall, and he always played Santa Claus, always. And he was always missing. We always said, Mom, why is Dad not here for Christmas? <laughs> well, he doesn't get on with Santa Claus. Mommy said, I said, oh. That's what they would do so he could play Santa yes, Claus. Yes, he, he played. And I believed, honest mm. to God, I believed. I swear. It's true, honestly. Right. And I believed it for so long. And then, around holidays, my dad used to used drink, right? And you know that there were so many boys in the family, all younger than me, one or two older, girls in the family. But you know you get a hug from your dad, get a little hug from your dad. And the one thing I always remembered that was distinctly his own and belonged to nobody else was the smell of whiskey off his breath. Yeah, really. This is most extraordinary. And then came the final Christmas, when I was about six. And he came down, he came in with the bag and all the uh, red and the white beard. And then he gave us out the presents. And then he handed me my prize. I said, thank you, Santa Claus. And he, and, I, I, and he put his hands around me and he kissed me. And I said, that's my dad's special smell. <laughs> and that's when I twigged. The most ridiculous reason in the world to twig. That's when I twigged. My dad was, was Santa Claus. Yeah. The smell of whiskey off his breath. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, that's kind of sad. Yeah? Santa comes with a bag in the bag. <laughs> Find it out all at once. Oh, we'll take a short break here at uh, the Chemical Company and be right back. Stay with us. <laughs> Tell us a little bit uh, why you decided to do the album. The, the Prophet has been a popular book uh, for many, many years. It's been out, and every year it seems to uh, take on a little more meaning for people. And uh, it's a bestseller, I guess year after year after oh, year yeah. and um it was this an idea you had in the back of your mind for a while to do uh well i that's the it's the third time i've been asked to do it and the other two times i was asked to do it the rights of the company didn't have the rights to do it they were mm -hmm. very involved it took the man actually who put this together eight years to actually unravel the rights in mm -hmm. lebanon uh because uh, gibran when he died or, or, or before he died he bequeathed the rights of all his works to the, to the village he was born in. And so to That's get that, so to unravel them, it was so difficult. But it took eight years to, to, uh, to put it together, and it took, us, it took us four months to record it, plus $300,000. I think it's the richest album ever made. That's fantastic. And the most expensive album mm. ever, you know, ever made. When's the first time you read The Prophet? Do you remember? Oh, God, years Most years people ago. do. The first time yeah, they pick it up, yeah. it makes such an impression yeah, on them. That you, you read I, the whole thing completely yeah. through. Yeah, I remember the... I remember I, I got... When I was out on concert tours, you know, fans give you gifts after the show and that. And right. I think 80% of the gifts that I got were actually The Prophet. So I've been sort of close to it in that respect. It's an interesting concept, putting music behind it and doing it. Remember yeah, that it's so great. Well. It took, you know, Arif Mardena produced it and wrote the music. He's really an extraordinary man. Uh, he went to, he went to uh, Lebanon for uh, eight weeks to get the background of music, the classical instruments there, and the ancient instruments that still, still exist there. 
Yeah, the last time you were here, I think, or the time before, you uh, you read something you wrote when you were about 12 years old. Uh, oh, yeah, I did. Uh, poetry, then you did uh, I and the Membership of My, my yeah, Days, my right? Yeah, My Days, yeah, right. Right. Yeah. Did, you, did, you ever, did you know Dylan Thomas at all? I didn't. I'd love to. I, he's the, I'd love to. I'd love to have no, I think he's the, he's the greatest, you know, from... I love... I studied poetry, and I, I, I'm a, I love it. But uh, Dylan is probably the greatest lyric poet of all time. And he was also an extraordinarily funny man. Wild, right. crazy, bizarre, Rabelaisian man. Yeah. Together. I remember, I tell you... Well, mob... So are you, in a way. <laughs> are you not? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I tell you a funny story. This is a true story about Dylan Thomas. When he was in Wales, a place, a little village called Larne. This is true story. It's, it's, it's marvellous. And he was having an affair with a woman in the village. And the husband was away somewhere at war, something ridiculous like that. So anyway, when the husband came back, Dylan was in the house. And Dylan had intended to stay in the house and carry on the relationship. But the man went berserk. And, and uh, he attacked Dylan and tried to kill Dylan. And Dylan was taken to court. The man was taken to court, uh, arrested for, for attempted murder on Dylan Thomas. So in the court case, Dylan was on the witness stand. And the judge said to Dylan, well, can you tell us, Mr. Thomas, uh, precisely what happened when the husband came in? And Dylan said, well, I was there on the couch, he said, with his wife. And he broke in the door with a gun. And I wrestled with him, and I took the gun off him. And the judge said, yes, and what happened then? Then he said he proceeded to pull a hand grenade from his pocket. And he said, give me back the gun. <laughs> and, the judge, and the judge said, and what did you do? I gave him back the gun. He said, better to die of a single shot than being blown to smithereens. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great line. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's nice. uh, extraordinary. I, I asked you during the break, were you going to spend uh, the holidays? You said you're going to go back to the East Coast? Yeah, I go to New York to Annie's parents for a couple of days, and then my kids come. We go to the Bahamas. Yeah, did you ever work at all with Bob? You were uh, Hope. Oh, uh, I'll never forget it. I know he's coming on now. I'll never forget as long as I live. You know, when you live in Ireland, you hear of the Academy Awards and these actors you adore and all so forth. You never dreamt. I never dreamt as a child that one day I'd actually meet them all and work indeed with some of people like Jimmy Cagney, who was my, who I played Jimmy Cagney when I was six. I bags to be Jimmy Cagney today in our games, you know, and Gary Cooper and people like that. And Bob Hope was always a great favorite of mine, Bob Hope. And, and suddenly I'm invited after Sporting Life to present at the Academy Awards. And I thought, my God, I've made it. Harris has made it. Wouldn't my mother be proud of me? <laughs> so I get dressed up and I hire the suit. And suddenly I'm told I'm on next. And Bob Hope is there, being brilliantly funny. And I can see him there. And I, God, look, he's marvelous. I, have it? I, I just walk. I, I hope I get to shake his hand. And suddenly he said, now he said to present the awards for so and so and so and so. We have Mr. Richard Harris from Sporting Life. And I walked on. As he was walking off, and we're walking past like that, and as he just got to pass me, Bob Hope said, your flies are open. <laughs> <laughs> and I stopped in front of 100 million people and did this. <laughs> Ruined. Of course, they hadn't heard him at all. No, they, they hadn't heard, heard him. That's the, that's just, right. just you heard that's him. That's right, Johnny's right. They hadn't heard him say your the flies are open. <laughs> but they saw me stop at the center of the stage <laughs> and do that. Real high-class actor from Ireland. Yeah. That's uh, funny. There goes Harris boasting again. That's... <laughs> <laughs> Who else did you idolize when you were a kid? Cagney? Uh... Oh, Cagney yeah. and Bogart and all of that. I worked with Cagney first, and I worked with... I worked with... Uh, I worked with Gary Cooper and those. They were all right. my... They were all, I was, they were all my heroes. Yeah. It was really extraordinary. Everybody as kids ran around and impersonated Cagney and, oh, yeah. and Bogart and all yeah. those people. Didn't you do Brando last time you were here? Oh, yeah. I... Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was fun. <laughs> I remember. I do. See you doing Julius Caesar. You want me to do this first? And Mr. Bob Hope will join us right after this brief pause. It's always kind of nice when Bob Hope comes to Los Angeles for one of his recent stopovers, because we usually get him on the show. Uh, he moves more than anybody in show business. You think you travel? Uh, Bob will be at the Pan American Arena in Lo uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico for a scholarship benefit. And this Sunday, December the 15th, his Christmas special will be on NBC at 9 following uh, Bing Crosby. 
And in between jobs, he's managed to, to get a book published called The Last Christmas Show. Would you welcome Mr. Bob Hope? Sugar? Uh, I, don't, I don't really know what it is that, that, that there is. You no, know, you have all my sponsors there. <laughs> that audience is so nice, they're still applauding my monologue when you walk out. <laughs> sensational. It's How funny, you you're so loyal. You're wearing your Christmas tie already, huh? That's right. Got Isn't my, that nice? My tie the network. Very beautiful. You look very sharp tonight. I'd never said a thing like that to you. <laughs> <laughs> and I wouldn't say you're... F How many flies do you have? <laughs> with your wife back there, you know? She's so amazed. She didn't know that. She said she prepares your clothes and you only have one. <laughs> I'm not going to pass any remark on that. <laughs> I you know, it actually that. happened to me at a command performance. I don't know what I told you. Did this, you do I that? I was at a command performance with the Laurence Olivier and the British stars in 1947 at the Odeon Theater in Leicester Square. And after the show, we went downstairs into the lounge waiting for the king and queen, you know? The, you know, the late king and queen. And we're standing there and saying, how did we do, you know, at the, at the show and everything. And I got, I got tails on. And uh, there's a Mo Montgomery, Robert Montgomery, Loretta Young, <laughs> Alexa Smith, Craig Stevens, and all the British stars at the other side. And all at once they said, here they are. So we all straighten up like this, you know, so, so, so. We're all straight. And Olivier is right across him and he went. <laughs> <laughs> and the king and queen are right here. I thought that was part Murder. of. I thought that was protocol. Maybe you. Who know? I've never, never met the king and queen. I, I wouldn't want to get those kind of laughs. You know, <laughs> you know there was a uh, there was a leader in Flushing at the RKO house that was, that was a stock thing with him. You know how the first show. Right. And when I was there, I was showing my act, and this cat used to do it to everybody. You'd get out there and you say, "Hey, a funny thing happened to me." And he'd go, "Shh." <laughs> you'd break up your routine and walk back and go. And everything was cool, just everybody. And start from there, you know? Yeah. Have you traveled more this year than, than, than last year? I really have. Oh, I got, a, I got a line for you. Yeah. I was in Hayes, Kansas. You know where that is? Well, I... Hayes, Kansas is where the University of Kansas has a branch. It's like Santa Barbara here for you. you know, right. University of Kansas. I, I rehearsed the show, and uh, I said, where's the best place to eat? And the guy said, Dave's Steakhouse. So I went down there, and it was one of those restaurants when you're in there, man, you're wide open. There's no booths or anything, and you're sitting right in there, and you're a target, you know. Somebody didn't like the show, they could stab you right there, and, you know, who would talk in haze? But uh, <laughs> finally, after signing a few autographs, the waitress, I was just about to leave, she said, you have to say hello to the cook. And I said, I only play the big room. She said, no. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to because he owns the place that's Dave. So on the way out, I opened the door. I said, hey, goodbye, y'all. And he rushed up to me with an with a apron on and a, and a T-shirt, you know, with a menu on it and the whole thing. <laughs> and he said, hey, bye. when you get back to Johnny Carson's show, you tell him it's so windy here in Hayes, Kansas, that we have white caps in the toilet. <laughs> I never thought I'd hear the day when Dave would be the hit of the show. <laughs> Do a monologue out here, nothing. Dave from the steakhouse. <coughs> I went to the auditorium, and you know that was a pretty big laugh, and even in Hayes Candy. <laughs> Dave. <laughs> no, it was great. Dave have, must have writers in the back room there. The writing. things you hear, do you, you get that? Do you get that they throw jokes at you every place? Yeah. They do at me, you know. I, down in Texas, you know, they get the Aggies, which are right. the, really the of Texas, the Aggies. <laughs> <laughs> One guy said, you know how the Aggies would have handled Watergate? I said, no. He said, the same way. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> okay, you and Earl Butts are gonna do it again, yeah. huh? Uh, Isn't he beautiful, Earl yeah. Butts? They're fitting him for a lightning rod now. <laughs> Earl the Pearl. You know, the Earl knew he was in trouble when they summoned to him to the White House and he saw a black smoke coming out of the chimney. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I, I <laughs> he, uh, he used to be Secretary of Agriculture, now he's a pillar of salt. But we don't mind that, do we? <laughs> All right. How about the book here? The Last Christmas Show. Is it the, Do you this... have a book, too? Yeah. What is this, book night? Uh, <laughs> this is not just about the last Christmas show you did overseas, but this is the whole story of about the last 30 years, 30 isn't it, of entertaining uh, mm -hmm. servicemen all over the world. It should be fascinating. Yeah. The last Christmas show. And this will be one of the few years that uh, yeah. you're going to be uh, here it's in this country It's five, Christmas. It's five languages already. And they, is that and right? They, and they translated it into English right after I finished it. <laughs> <laughs> I copied a few of the one-liners you use now in the book in 1950. Oh. 20, 24 years ago. See how they work here. Would you rather have Ed read it? I heard this your mom. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, folks. But, uh, but I want to tell you. Uh, but I want to tell you. <laughs> Bobo Christmas tour in 1950, talking about Les Brown's band. We had a little trouble with the band. While the medics were giving us shots for the trip, they kept going back for seconds. One, two, two three, four. <laughs> We had to bring the band back to Tokyo. It was time for their annual bath. <laughs> Look, folks, these are, 24, these, these are 24 years. <laughs> these are 24 years ago. Yeah, right, yeah. right. Did you, did you, how do you manage to remember? Do you, do you, uh, do you ever keep a diary? Well, uh, Pete Martin, you know, uh, went around and talked to about 40 people. Everybody right. went on the trip, and then he came back to me, and we sat in front of a mic, and he, he threw all these questions at me. And, of course, we, the thing writes itself, you know, because we, we have so many notes, and Betty Lanigan and Bill Faith, and all the people who were with us, they, they remember different incidents, and then we patch it all together. And it's, it's, was there any one of the trips who was uh, any more memorable than... Yeah, I think other. so. I think the one we did with England and North Africa in 43, because we experienced uh, something that I wasn't looking for, and that was a lot of bombing, you know, <laughs> where uh, I dove into the ditch ahead of Langford and things like that, some, uh, <laughs> some hero other heroic adventures, you know? <laughs> but uh, we were bombed in Bizzardi, and we were bombed in Palermo, and it's in the book. I tried to get under the bed. I didn't know whether to get to between the spring or the mattress or... <laughs> Oh, because they were bombing, Daddy, and I was just laying there saying my whole life passed before me. And uh, actually, it was my lunch, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it was something else. And uh, Ike, we saw Ike uh, the day, the next, a couple of days later in Algiers, he said, uh, I understand you've been in a couple of bombings. I said, yeah, it's not my racket. He said, but don't worry about it here. He said, hell, we haven't had a bombing here for four months, you know. And that night, about 3 o'clock, wow, wow, I got up and Pepper's knocking on my door. I said, hey, get Francis Langford. This is it. And I got up. We went down to the wine cellar of the Letty Hotel, which they were using for a bomb shelter. And I'm sitting there, you know, with no seatbelt, just sitting there. And they're going boom, 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 boom. And Stubby K walked into the room, which made the whole thing. We didn't even know he was in the country, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell are you doing here? Well, I'm with the unit, too. Where, uh, where do you sit? Right there, buddy. And the whole room, how did you bump it, you and the thing finished after about an hour and a half, you know, it was all clear, and we went upstairs, and Quentin Reynolds, we'd met them the day before, and Clark Lee and H.R. Knickerbocker and Steinbeck went to their room to talk about the thing. They never got out of bed. They slept through the whole thing. I said, wait a minute, you don't get up for a bombing? He said, what's the difference? If you're gonna die, die in bed. <laughs> so I'll know if we ever have another war. That's the... <laughs> St stay in your Sealy. Of course, a, of course, a wine cellar isn't a bad place to be during a bombing, either. No, not at all, because the whole hotel lands on you like that. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> and at the undertakers, they slip you under the door, you know. <laughs> Number five. <laughs> they mail you home. Well, we'll take a short break, then we're going to have some outtakes. Jeez. Here's the Sunbeam Shave Master, Shaver and Groomer. This really looks like a... <laughs> Really looks like a fascinating book, The Last Christmas Show, by Bob Hope, as told Mr. Pete Martin. Big book, too. Yeah, it's a heavy kid. Big book. Well, you've, had a, you've had a remarkable career. Who's on your special tomorrow night? 
We have uh, the Associated Press All-American football team and Dean Martin, and uh, we're doing Airport 76. You know. Airport 76. Wouldn't you like to fly with him? <laughs> with Dean as the pilot? Get a great sketch where he drinks all the fuel, and then we try to take off. <laughs> and we have Olivia St. John, a uh, very beautiful gal, a great singer, and Diane Cannon, who brings it all with her, and uh, who else? We have Singing Angels. That's it. It sounds like a good show. Now, yeah. we have some outtakes here. We follow here. Bing. Follow Bing yeah. and his family, right? He always does the warm-up for us. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's fun. He's Every good. time Bob comes on, he usually brings the outtakes. These are things you will not see on the show. These are the goofs, the uh, things that went wrong in rehearsal or miscues or what have you. And uh, they're funny. I don't know what we're going to see tonight. So watch the monitor here in the studio. Bob, you want to roll the film. Here's a little preview of what you won't see. I gather your marriage was a disaster. A disaster? Have you seen Earthquake? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and that was just the honeymoon. <laughs> hey, you made a half-hour play out of that. I like that. <laughs> hey. I know what you mean. I was married to a woman whose idea of a fun evening was to go down to the supermarket and squeeze the honey uh, melon. <laughs> Was she romantic? Very. Every night she watched Johnny Carson by candlelight. But he goes off at one o'clock. I know. That's when she got her headache. <laughs> she was more excedrin than Telly Savalas' singing teacher. <laughs> are you going to give are you, an introduction from you? Let me hear it. Oh, that's, oh, that's sweet. terrific. What time do they bring the body in? What the hell is <laughs> What is that? <laughs> I thought we were. I just got to look at myself. I look like Helen Reddy. For <laughs> Just have an intimate little dinner. Just the two of us, huh? Yeah. Well, as always, the Charlton Hestons. Oh, no, dear. I mean, Hess is so disaster prone. <laughs> Let's just yeah, have I never an thought that would happen to Moses. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to save it. <laughs> Why don't we just have. Hey, I was, I was hoping you'd say that. You think that'll fit? Are you turning chicken? Me? A man who's been in fifth, five? <laughs> Me? Are you turning chicken? I think so. <laughs> so much I want to see. I want to see the sun come up over Pismo Beach. And I want to walk across the Golden Gate Bridge just once more before the Japanese buy it. <laughs> Did you want to see Rhoda's sister get married? <laughs> you dirty <did> thief. <laughs> I gotta do a big for you. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> you wanna do that line? No, it's fine. That, you can have hey, it. That, <laughs> If we ever beat this rap, will you do me a favor? Sure what? Go on your roast? <laughs> yeah. And after the roast, go take some acting lessons. That's this coming Sunday. That's, uh, that's this coming Sunday night following a Bing's uh, special on NBC. Those are funny. Funny. Now, you're off for Las Cruces, New Mexico? Las Cruces, New Mexico. For, uh, Scholarship benefits? Why aren't you there? <laughs> yeah. Then yeah, you're going to be scholarship fund. We got Barbara McNair. And, That's great. Uh, Miss New Mexico and all that. I think you want to go. <laughs> I think you, I think you inadvertently when you said you said Diane Carroll, Diane Cannon, you matter. Diane? What did I say? Yeah. I think you said uh, Diane Carroll. You're before kidding. Before we went into there. Olivia Newton John. Yeah. Olivia St. John. I said Olivia St. John. Yeah. Olivia. I'm going to go back to Meningers. You know. 
<laughs> I'm just on a loan out here. <laughs> Isn't that murder? I said that? Yes. God, I gotta... I go. thought you said, maybe maybe I misunderstood. I, I thought you said Diane Carroll. I gotta lay down a little bit. Well, you minute. travel. It's the time zone. No, you left. You were on the Today I, Show in New York today? I love it. You got on a plane or yesterday morning? Yeah, you... yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. You gonna be home for Christmas? This sure year? am. Yep. Right. Thanks for coming. Right. Great Anytime. to see you. Thank you. back. Steve Landisberg is here and uh, Adrian Barbo will join us right after this. <laughs> Steve Landisberg is here tonight. He's uh, He can be seen in the last few episodes of the Paul Sand Show. He'll be with Don Rickles on his special in January. He is, uh, he's totally off the wall, this man. Would you welcome Steve Landisberg? Thank you, Grindling. That's his name, the Dr. Grindling. Most of the people that, that are watching the show now are probably watching the news. Now, I'm a big news watcher because the whole world comes on the news. I mean, you see everything. My, my favorite thing on the news, though, is sports. And this is a big year in sports for firsts. This year in pro football, you got the first black quarterback. And next year, the baseball season, you're going to have the first black manager. I'm looking for the first Jewish duck hunter. Because <laughs> you know, you know duck hunters usually like, hey, lamb over there in the brush and yell some, Millet over there got the mallet and everything. <laughs> Who's that stranger coming up there? Who's that strange? Oh, that's that Jew duck hunter. <laughs> Well, uh, what's going on, boys? Uh, what are you using, 22s? How's the vintage? <laughs> Love those different sounds. You know, you know what's fascinating? You watch the news, and it never goes away. Prejudice has been with us from the year one. And it always happens the same way. Little kids beat up other little kids in neighborhoods, and then when they get older, they get married. They beat, they beat up the groups, then they marry the groups. It happens in big cities. There's a lot of that on a Texas-Mexican border. People are fighting, then one day it's over. Juanita, I would like you to be the future Mrs. Beauregard Harper. Because <laughs> you understand, my darling, you won't be allowed to leave your room. <laughs> I have certain political ambitions. But I went to go shopping. <laughs> You know what my favorite news item is? This is gonna happen very shortly. Very shortly, it happens every six months or so. Every six months or so, another Japanese soldier comes out of the jungle. Last guy was in the jungle for 29 years, didn't know the war was over. Suddenly came out of the jungle one day, oh, I overthrift. <laughs> He was sent in on an intelligence mission. <laughs> That's it, 29 years in the jungle, the guy didn't know the war was over. That's not that unusual. There are people in the valley that don't know the war was over. <laughs> I love the sound of that language. I sometimes watch Japanese television without knowing what the hell they're talking about, but I love, I love to listen to it, and I feel stupid. I really feel like an idiot because I don't understand a word of it, and I know there's a little child in Japan who listening to his father understands everything the man says. I mean, I know there's a kid right now in Japan listening to his dad. <laughs> I'll tell you what makes me feel dumber than that. This makes me feel dumber. There's a little animal in Japan, a doggy. A dumb doggy will understand Japanese. I know there's a dog who is listening right now to Woof, woof, <laughs> I feel retarded. You know what's great on the, you know what's great? You watch the news, you watch every country in the world, and I just recently watched the English elections. They have elections every week. And what's interesting, it's usually the same two guys. And they campaign much differently than we do. They don't speak about issues at all. They don't bother with issues. 
All they do is sling mud. Their whole campaign is, my distinguished and esteemed opponent, Lord Worcestershire, shares his chambers with a goat. <laughs> I wonder, do you know, of course you don't know. I don't even know. Do you know that Sweden, Sweden has one of the highest suicide rates in the world? Now, I don't know why that is. And maybe it's uh, the climate. It's cold, damp climate. If you've ever been to an Ingmar Bergman movie, they can be very depressing. But they just seem to do it over there for no reason. I mean, a man comes home from work, he's very happy. Zippity doo da. <laughs> Butts for supper, Snookums. <laughs> Asparagus. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you have, a, you have a strange, funny head working there. <laughs> Thank you, Prince of Burbank. <laughs> <laughs> oh, are, you a, are, you, are you a scout now in California permanently? I, I guess I, I've been here for like two years, and you know, I, I feel a, a little bit in New York because, yeah. because everybody's out here now. Mm. I work at the comedy store in Hollywood, and I walk in the comedy store, and the same guys I work with in New York, Jimmy Walker, Freddie Prince, Gabe Kaplan, David Brennan. We all work the same. It's the same thing, same guys. Because right. Brennan still doesn't live here. No. He doesn't live here, but he always seems to be out here to do the Carson show. Right. I think he does more Carson shows than... I think he's the last Johnny holdout. Oh. <laughs> he's the last he's holdout. I don't think he will ever uh, really become a Californian. If uh, you, you never know. California is... Uh, you know what I like out here that... Uh, well, you know, liars. Everybody knows guys that lie. And, and the biggest lies that men have always told have always been about sex and women. Now, out in Hollywood, you got guys tell you stories out here. They're better because they got names to drop. They got, there are movie stars out in television. So when a guy tells you a story out here, it's a beauty. You know, it's like, uh, she's up for an Oscar, eh? I gave her an Academy Award one night. <laughs> I gave her Oscar. <laughs> yeah, I met her over there in that, uh, what was the all-night supermarket, Ralph? <laughs> no, I didn't go home with her. I did it right there in frozen food. <laughs> <laughs> Every, everything out here is show business, though. Because yeah. I mean, like I said, I'm at the comedy store, everybody's in show. What do you hear? I haven't seen guys for two years, from, from, but no. they keep coming out here, because the business is out here. And you can't speak to people, because all they do is talk about show business. And it's like, you, you know, you haven't seen, I say, hey, man, I haven't seen you for, how you doing? Two years, I haven't seen you. I just did a Kojak. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's terrific. I'm great. Well, how's your, how's your mom? How's mother? Mom, mom's doing Columbo. <laughs> and now... Just shot a pilot. I yeah. just did the pilot with Rickles. Uh, I did a pilot with Rickles, and... Uh, oh, if he doesn't get it on, I have, I heard that Mr. Scandori, his manager, Joseph Scandori has bought him a network in Milan. I <laughs> <laughs> oh, could wipe out another country, huh? Let me take a break here. No matter what you're doing, it's always nice to stop and have a nice, brisk cup of Lipton tea. Adrienne Barbo is with us tonight. She's a fine actress and won a Tony nomination uh, for the Broadway musical Grease, and she's probably most familiar viewers as Maud's daughter in the television show. Would you welcome Adrian Barbo? <laughs> Gee, you look pretty tonight. Thank you. That's an awfully good show, that television show, you know what? Maud really is. We're doing better yeah. this year than we have done all, all in the last two. We were number two one yeah. week and number four. And we're having a good time. Good cast of people, and they really, they play well together. 
So, what have you been up to besides that? Does, do you have any time to do anything else professionally besides that show? Oh, I love to come here, and I've been yeah. doing some game shows, but that's about it. You know, we go on hiatus in March, and then maybe I'd like to do something. March, then you're March through to all June. through the summer? That's it. Whew. It's strange <laughs> to be here with Richard, because I'm going to a, a screening of Camelot tomorrow night. You are? <laughs> yes. I never saw it, and I have a friend who loves that film, oh, so we're going to see it. Super at it. <laughs> have, you, have you done your Christmas shopping yet or anything? My Christmas shopping is all done. You're kidding. No, I'm, I'm a person that starts thinking about things in August, you know. I mean, I start listening to what people want, just hints that they're dropping, and then I love to shop. I say that every year to myself. I'm going to start next year, maybe November, October, Christmas shopping. <laughs> And I got to get cracking next week, but I never do it. Mine's all done. I go to Pasadena to shop. I go, I shop in, I, I order things from New York. And I get strange Christmas gifts in return. Like what? Well. Do fans send you gifts? No, I haven't received anything from <coughs> fans, but lovers give me very strange Christmas gifts. Um, well, let's, let's, let's explore that. Fire <laughs> There seems to be an opening for a little uh, conversation right there. Fire extinguishers. You get fire extinguishers? I got a fire extinguisher. I got flares for my car. I got a necklace that had St. Christopher on one side and a Star of David on the other. And this year I'm getting a set of World Book Encyclopedias. <laughs> That's from the Phi Beta Kappa lover, I said. <laughs> when, you, when you say lovers, you mean lovers? More than one, yeah. <laughs> yes. I'll be well, what would I say? <laughs> strange, Johnny, because boyfriend is a very weird word. I mean, I don't relate to that very much. You know, mm -hmm. boyfriend seems like a, a boyfriend that seems like something young or something. And I used to say the man that I'm seeing, and that's very strange. Yeah, what are you going to say? It's kind of euphemistic, isn't it? Yeah. So you just say out and out? Lovers. Lovers. <laughs> yeah, they <God>. are. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's explore this a little further. <laughs> Academy Award for... Oh, no. <laughs> In other words, you're not, uh, you're not currently going with just somebody that's uh, serious. It's really none of my business anyway, but as long as you're here... Uh... No, it's not, but I'm grinning a lot more than I was last time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. You seem much happier, fulfilled. I'm having a lovely time. <laughs> I yeah. really am. Yeah. <laughs> and the strength... question? Yes. Why the fire extinguisher? Is there any particular reason for that? Well, I would like to think it had to do with something about me, but I don't know, Rich. No, I... You get, uh, more that it gets you hot. Get the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you get the analogy there, you see? I used to have a, I used to have a boss who was very... He, I, I can't help but think of it now, because he'd always come up to me in the morning and he'd go, Getting much? <laughs> <laughs> I was a hustler. <laughs> no, I, that kind of, you know. Yeah. Where are you from again? I forgot. Where'd you grow up? I'm from Northern California. All over California. Fresno and Sacramento and Stockton. Yeah. But I spent eight years in New York and feel like I grew up there. Yeah. And, uh, what do you give for Christmas? Not to, you, you get fire extinguishers, you said, and encyclopedias. What, what do you give, sir, for example, to your, to your lovers? I gave the state of Vermont. State of Vermont. <laughs> Well, they can probably exchange it for something they want. Yeah. <laughs> probably get Rhode Island thrown in. You know, you can make a deal on that. Um, I'm giving a very weird gift this year, but I can't tell because he might be watching. Well, he doesn't know who, though. Oh. <laughs> no, there's only one. There's, oh, there's only, only one at a time, John. I mean, ah. you know, they may come and go, but there's only one at a time. And uh, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> What's the goofiest gift you've ever given? You give, hmm. you give strange things or practical things? I, no, I pretty much give what I think people would want to receive, you know, and I, and I really do listen. Like um, Conrad Bain, who plays the doctor on our show, came right. to my house several months ago, <coughs> and I'm sure he's asleep tonight, so I, I don't think it'll matter. He goes to bed very early. <laughs> yeah. And admired something in the house that I had just purchased, and I thought, oh, wow, okay. And I put it away, and I wrapped it up, and I never touched it, and I, I thought, that's for him, because that's, he admired it, and I had never touched it. So. You give things to him? To people Only that they that, admire? That was, yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> While you all make up your own joke, we'll move along here. <laughs> what do you want for Christmas, Steve? Anything in particular? Yeah, I'd like a new show. 
Dear Santa. Pilot. I want to go up for a pilot. Pilot. Everybody in this town is always doing a pilot. Every time you see somebody in this town, what are you doing? I got a pilot, pilot, pilot deal, pilot, pilot. <laughs> I got a pilot, MGM, pilot, pilot. <laughs> Maybe you want to have a beer or something? No beer, pilot. <laughs> All I want is a pilot. <laughs> pilot, pilot, pilot. <laughs> I swear to God, a guy came up in, in the street, in, out of an alley, and said, hey, man, you spare some change? I pay it back next week, I'm doing the pilot. Oh, you love it. Yeah, we'll be right back. <laughs> And, Merry uh, Christmas. Same to you. We don't see you then, Steve. Thank come you. back with us soon again, will you? Thank you. And Richard, thanks for being here. The album is The Prophet. Thank you. Uh, by Mr. Richard Harris. And tomorrow night we have Rich Little, Bobby Vinton, Cornell uh, University astronomer Carl Sagan, and Cloris Leachman will be here. Thank you. Good night. I'm humbled by that applause.